world. We've talked about, from a biblical perspective, the, the rapture and the Antichrist last week. And so today, we're going to talk about a couple of the other popular to- topics that usually come up in a conversation about the end times when you're talking from a biblical perspective. So we're going to talk about the tribulation and the mark of the beast. Not something you hear a lot about in church. Uh, I have never actually spoken on this before, and this series is is so new and uh, so different for us around here, but I'm enjoying it and uh, uh, hearing feedback from you guys of just that you're learning things and, and just uh, growing in the Lord, so that's been good to hear. But on a side note, I really... The, the danger of this message series and why a lot of pastors avoid it is because it's complicated and it's confusing. And I don't, I don't want it to be that way, um, especially today. So I'm going to try to make the teaching today palatable, at least palatable enough to where we're still getting into it. We're still getting through some of the details and it's still based in Scripture. But it's also helpful to us in providing some clarity on these end times events and these, these characters that are described in Scripture. So maybe needless to say, we're not going to be covering every passage in Revelation and in other books of the Bible that have to do with these issues. So we would be here uh, probably till next Sunday if we, if we did that. But let's start by jumping right in and just talking about the tribulation. And maybe for some that's a totally new word. So the question is, what is the tribulation? Maybe you've heard it in the movies or you heard grandma talk about it. But what what really is it? Well, traditionally, it refers to the specific seven-year time period of great suffering and great destruction on earth before the second coming of Christ. And by the way, there are notes in your bulletin if you want to follow along. I've tried to provide the scriptures and all that um, if you want to take it home and, and look into it some more. But we see in Daniel 7 and Daniel 9 that, that there's this seven-year period of suffering that is coming. What is the tribulation? Well, it's different than just the general tribulation or general suffering that we all go through as if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ. Jesus said that you're going to face trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. But he said, have, do not fear because I've overcome the world. He said that in, in John so it's, it's two different things, the, the tribulation versus just tribulation or trials or suffering that we go through. They're not the same thing. The tribulation is also more severe than anything that's ever happened on earth. You see that in Matthew 24. It's so severe. And Revelation 6 tells us that it will be so bad that people will want to run and hide and even die. But Matthew 24 also tells us that it's going to be shortened. So this seven-year time is actually a shortened time. Scripture says, for the sake of the elect, because otherwise no one could survive it any longer. So the Lord's grace and mercy will step in and shorten the tribulation to this seven years, as it could have been much longer. And then lastly, that the second half is called the great tribulation, because the suffering will be much worse. So... It's really divided into two parts, the first half of the tribulation, and then things shift. We talked about that a lot last week about what the Antichrist is going to do. And then the second half will be much worse, much more severe uh, suffering and tribulation in that part. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky, because if you look at the book of Revelation, and if you look at specifically chapters 6 through 16, sort of like in that middle section of the book, it's a large section, but you'll read about these three symbols for judgment, and it takes up a good portion of the book of Revelation. You read about these seals, these seven seals, and then these seven trumpets, and then these seven bowls. Kind of uh, strange, Im- strange imagery for us, um, but these, these symbols are often connected to the tribulation. Now, we could easily get bogged down here as we try to like go over each one, all 21 of them, and, and all the details of that. But let me just give you a brief overview of a, a snapshot, if you will, of what they are. So in Revelation 6 is when these judgments start. But in Revelation 5, Jesus is the only one that's found worthy to break these seven seals that are found on a scroll. 
They, they, they couldn't find anyone that was worthy or was powerful enough to, to break these seven seals, to open this scroll. But Jesus, who is represented as the lamb in Revelation, comes and he is found worthy. So he opens them one by one. And as each one is opened, judgments are unleashed on the earth. And so there's a lot of ways to interpret how all of this plays out. And man, there are, there are about as many theories uh, out there as there are grains of sand on the beach. I mean, there's a lot of, of ways that people interpret this, but, but one viewpoint says that the seals have yet to be opened at all, that we're waiting on Jesus to start opening them, and that is going to begin this prophetic t- uh, timeline, this countdown. Um, so they have not even been opened. The judgments, the, the seal judgments are still in the future. And we're waiting for that. Another interpretation says that the first five seals have already been opened throughout history. You can see the evidence of, of uh, historical things happening that really tie into these first five seals. So we're really just waiting for Jesus to open the sixth seal. So if you, if you look at anything online or you look, glance at YouTube or something, you may see something about the sixth seal or we're awaiting the sixth seal. That, that's what they're talking about. And when the sixth seal is opened, then uh, the judgment that's released is this great earthquake and all kinds of crazy things start happening in the heavenlies. The, the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountains, it says, and the islands are removed from their places. So this is a pretty serious judgment. So Revelation 6 is the account of of these seven seal judgments. And technically, the seventh seal uh, isn't opened until chapter 8. But but Revelation 6 is really where we look. And if you've ever heard of, anybody ever heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? You've heard of that? Maybe you you like movies that have that in it, or, or you've just heard that terminology. Well, that this is where it comes from. This section right here in uh, Revelation 6, where we see the seals, there's seven of them, but the first four seals that are opened by Jesus, each one represents a different horseman of the apocalypse. So the, the, the first one, the first seal, Jesus opens, and John said that he saw a rider on a white horse. And it, it kind of gives us the idea of Jesus, like, wait a minute, Jesus returns on a white horse, maybe this is Jesus. But the description that he gives is not Jesus. And so there's a, there's a lot of theories on who this even is. But one, one of the most popular ones is that this represents the Antichrist. If you were in the early church, you may have believed this represents uh, Rome or this represents Nero. But it could represent the Antichrist and the judgments that come along with it, with him. The second seal is the red horse. The rider on a red horse, and, and this represents war. So the judgment unleashed is just war. I mean, you think maybe like a World War III thing that's happening. Uh, the third one is the, the black horse, which is holding these weights, these measures in his hand, kind of like buying and selling food. So it's the idea of famine, that, that famine will strike the earth. And then the fourth horse is probably the scariest of all, is this pale rider that I picture looks like a zombie. It represents death. And, and it comes along with another one behind him, uh, which represents Hades, this, this idea of, of the grave and death and um, pestilence, uh, disease, like uh, the image of some like flesh rotting. I mean, it's pretty, pretty graphic here. So that's, that's the seal judgments when we're talking about tribulation, these connect to that time. Revelation 8 and 9, we learn about the, the seal, I'm sorry, the, the trumpet judgments. And again, the last trumpet is in a different chapter. It's forward in chapter 11. But chapters 8 and 9, we have these angels that blow these trumpets, and judgments again are unleashed on the earth. And then finally is Revelation 16. That's the seven bowl judgments where these angels have these bowls and in them is judgment. And one by one, they pour the bowl over the earth and severe judgment is released. Now, these three types of judgments, these seals and these trumpets and these bowls, they could be sequential. 
meaning that they, this could be describing a series of events that happen in somewhat of a chronological order. Like first you would have the seals that are opened and the judgments of the Lord come. And then you have the trumpets and more judgments come. And then finally, the most severe of all would be the bowls. Uh, they're much harsher and they would occur uh, in the tribulation as well. But the bowls being so harsh would occur in the last half of the tribulation when things, like I mentioned, get really bad, really, really worse, worse than they, they were in the first half. So that's one view. But another view is that these three descriptions, these symbols are, are not actually chronological, but that they're overlapped, that they describe the same thing from different vantage points. Those of you that watch sports, maybe you've, you know what this is like, where you have like a sideline camera, and you have a bleacher camera, and you have a blimp over, over view, and you got different views on the same thing. And so that, that's another view, that, that these symbols really are just describing the same series of events, the same judgments, uh, the same things in the end times. And uh, so this is, this, is where, this is where scholars try to piece together um, how the symbols apply to events like the tribulation. So I encourage you to go back and read Revelation 6 through 16 just to get a better, more full understanding of the symbolism um, that, that we're talking about when we talk about the tribulation. So let's talk about what will the signs of the, the tribulation be? What is, what is involved in the tribulation? What's it going to be like? What will we see? Well, there's f a few different types of signs. There'll be physical signs that we see. Physical signs is the first one. There'll be earthquakes and famine and disease. There'll be signs in the, in the sky and in the heaven like we talked about. They'll, they'll be getting worse and worse. We see that in Matthew 24. We also see it in Luke 21. And again, all these scriptures are listed there in your notes. They'll start really even before the tribulation in, in these birthing pains, like Matthew 24, like Jesus talks about, uh, that we read a couple weeks ago. And I believe that's where we are right now. We are in the birthing pains season. That, that things, the end times and all that have not come upon us yet, but that we are seeing the foreshadowing happening, the birthing pains, like when you're pregnant and you're getting towards the end and the contractions are getting closer together and the pain is getting worse and the baby's growing and getting bigger, it's almost time. There's physical signs we see in Revelation 6. John says, I watched as the lamb broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. This is pretty intense physical stuff happening in the earth. But there's also moral signs. There will be some moral things that change, the, the, the moral fabric of our world and Paul tells his protege Timothy this in 2 Timothy 3. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Does anybody see any of that going on in the world? Yeah. Verse 3, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. There's a moral shift happening. Do you see it? Do you see the birthing pains? that these things that Paul's describing, they're happening, aren't they? We're seeing the, the, the moral signs of the end starting to come about. There'll also be religious signs that false prophets will come. There'll be religious signs. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 23, he said, then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. There'll be false prophets that come. We have to be wise. We have to stick together as a church. We have to be discerning. We have to be in our word. We have to be studying and 
ready for these things, ready for the deception that will take some of our brothers and sisters and take them away to a, to a false gospel. They'll also be believers that turn away from the Lord and from each other. See, in, also in Matthew 24, verse 10, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. That'll be a sad day. Kind of echoing Jesus, Paul said to Timothy again in 1 Timothy 4, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. My goodness, this is intense stuff. That there will be people, there will be brothers and sisters in the Lord right now that will be deceived. Maybe, I mean, we could speculate on a number of reasons why, but they will follow the teachings of demons. That's a sobering thought. So there's physical signs, there's religious signs, there's also technological signs. There's technological signs of the tribulation. One is that there will be total, total global evangelism will be possible. In, in days and decades past, we thought, man, how is this ever going to happen? But now, with the digital age and the rise of the Internet, it's totally possible that, that the whole world will be reached with the gospel. Also, that, that economic control is gained, like we talked about last week, through, uh, through the anti Antichrist, through a cashless society, like we read about in Revelation 13. This digital age, technology will make it possible to be cashless, and then that will be leveraged and manipulated to, uh, to, to get economic control. Now, here's a couple interesting side notes that some believe that in Revelation 8, 7, and, and you can go back and check that out, that John could have been, he could have been seeing some kind of nuclear war, and he didn't have the terms like we would, but the sky was on fire and all of these descriptive words, he might be seeing some kind of nuclear end. Also, there's a part in Revelation 16, too, where, where these, these sores, these festering sores break out on people. And, and some people wonder, is that some version of radiation poisoning from, from a nuclear war that has broken out? It seems feasible. Like, that could be. These are very real things. This isn't fairy tales or stories. This is real stuff that's, that we're reading about in Scripture. So there's these, these different types of signs, physical, religious, technological, moral. Let's get moral. Also, the Jewish temple, another sign uh, of the tribulation is that the Jewish temple will, will be rebuilt by the middle of the tribulation. Now, we think, how in the world do we know that? Well, because... We, we get this picture from Scripture that the Antichrist, like we talked about last week, he will set himself up in the temple. You remember halfway through, he's going to break his treaty with the Jews. He's going to be their friend for a while and bring peace, help them build the temple, all these wonderful things. And then halfway through this seven-year period, he's going to say, okay, we're done with all of that. Take out all their stuff out of the temple desecrate their temple and set up an, something, some kind of image to himself to be worshipped. So in order for that to happen, the temple has to be there by the time he uh, gets, by the time he, he switches there in the middle of the, of the tribulation. Uh, so the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. Second Thessalonians 2, he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Along with this is that animal animal sacrifices must be returning to the temple at some point here in the future because Daniel 9:27 says that one of the things the antichrist is going to do is put a stop to all of the sacrifices in the temple. So kind of an interesting thing that these things will be returning. So these are signs to watch for to just keep in mind and to be alert and know that as these things unfold if we're here for the tribulation, that we may see some of this. Another sign is that the, uh, there will be 144,000 Jews that will become followers of Jesus and will share the gospel. Now, there's a lot of interpretation. Some people say it's really figurative uh, language. But really, the, the giveaway for me is in, in Revelation 7-4, 
Uh, John says, And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. Then he lists out all the tribes and that there's 12,000 from each. So it seems to me that he's meaning actually Jews from these tribes. And there's a number of ways that this could happen. I mean, that's a lot of people to, to come to the Lord. Maybe they have this, this supernatural, divine encounter directly with Jesus. Like, like the Apostle Paul, if you know his story, he was not serving God. He, he was anti-Jesus. And, and Jesus met him on the road with a blinding light. And he had a tremendous encounter and transformation experience. Maybe something like that will happen. But the Jews have a special role in the end, because God made a covenant with them long ago that they were the original people of God. They were the original messengers of God. And so there is a role, there is a place for Israel, for the Jews, in the end when this unfolds. And so if you look in Revelation 7, down to verse 9, we see that this great number of people come to believe in Christ because of the witness of of these 144,000. So this is a big deal. This is important, important part of how things unfold in the end. Also, we see in the tribulation, and maybe you've, you've heard of this, that there are two special witnesses that arrive on the scene, that they appear and they prophesy for three and a half years. In Revelation 11, verses 1 through 12, we read about these two people that God sends, that will preach the gospel, they'll perform signs and wonders, some pretty incredible things if you read the whole story. But then after the, the three and a half years, they, they will be killed. The Antichrist will actually be able to rise up against them and kill them. And then to just mock them even more, he puts their bodies out on the street for all to see. So the word in your notes there is witnesses. There's two special witnesses. But the cool thing is that they don't stay dead. I mean, this is going to be quite a scene, that these dead bodies will be on display, and then God will raise them from the dead, and they'll come back to life, and they'll go back to heaven. So we, we think that they probably show up during the first half of the tribulation, because when they're executed, that fits really well with how the Antichrist switches and becomes not the man of peace anymore, but he becomes the embodiment of rebellion and evil. And in that, in between, that midpoint, the witnesses, if they've been on the scene for three and a half years, that would be the perfect time for the Antichrist to come against them and kill them. And there's a lot of mystery on who these guys are. Who, who are these two witnesses? Well, they're probably, I think they're probably, and the most popular opinion is that they are Moses and Elijah. Because it, John describes what they do, some of their miracles that they perform and the signs and wonders. And they really line up with the miracles that, that Moses performed uh, and with what Elijah performed. Not to mention that those were the two characters that appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So th there may be a connection there um, between Moses and Elijah being these witnesses. But they could be two new figures altogether. We're, we're, not, we're just not sure. But they'll be there, two special witnesses. And then here's, here's where I kind of want to land today and talk, talk about this in a little more detail. Um, the last one is that the mark of the beast will be required for buying and selling. We ended here last week, and I read the passage from Revelation 13, 16, that says that the Antichrist and his helper, this false prophet, who's this guru in economics and religion, um, he, they'll make the whole world receive a mark so that they can buy and sell things. And so this, the false prophet's going to come and, and make everybody in the world make a choice. Either you receive the mark of the beast and you worship the Antichrist, or you starve because you won't be able to buy or sell anything. It's going to be a difficult time. But this whole mark of the beast thing, I don't know if, you, if you've connected these dots before, but if you read just the next verse, after this whole ominous mark of the beast little section of three, three verses, if you read the very next verse, Revelation 14.1, we find out that not only is there this mark of the beast, but God's people 
also had something written on their foreheads. They had the name of God the Father and the name of Jesus written on their foreheads. If you remember before, last week we talked about how Satan is just the great copycat. He doesn't have any original ideas. And so this mark of the beast is just a mockery of the true mark of the people of God. Satan wants to be like God, and he just copies him. And so he wants to have his mark too, I guess, because God has his on his people. And so it's an imitation, and it's a mockery. And like we, we read before in Revelation 16, 2, it says that painful sores came upon those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped the Antichrist. In other words, those who are loyal to the Antichrist will suffer the wrath of God. But on the other hand, if we fast forward to the end of the book in Revelation 20, verse 4, it tells us that those who believe in Jesus and those who refuse the mark of the beast, they are saved in the end, even though many of them will be executed by the Antichrist. It's a time where great courage is required. So let's talk about this mark. Is this mark actually a physical mark? I mean, we got people that love to get tattoos, right? You're thinking, man, is this just like a really cool tattoo? Is this some kind of piercing? Is this some kind of microchip? What is it? Is it figurative? What is this? Is it actually even a mark? Well, if you look at God's marking, it, it, it lends itself to be a figurative uh, interpretation that God's marking on his people represents his protection from the Antichrist and from separation from him, that it's his seal. And most likely, God's mark is going to be invisible. It's a mark that we wear on our inner person, on our hearts. But the Antichrist's mark will probably be some kind of visible mark that's external, that, that you can see. Apparently, it's, it's some kind of, uh, of a branding, maybe like you see on animals or like slaves um, from ancient times. There's been a lot of theories over the years, like, like uh, with the Holocaust, when they would mark them, many people thought, is that the mark of the beast? Or when the Roman uh, legionnaires would, would be marked, uh, tattooed um, as a symbol that they were part of the Roman army, they, there's thoughts that, oh man, that's this, this mark. Um, and then there's this, this number 666 that we read about. Some people are really paranoid about this, that if you're total at the gas station, you know, you're buying a candy bar and a soda and it's $6.66. What do you do? You got to buy a pack of gum, right? You got to do something else. You give me, give me a, a 25 cent mint or something. I can't pay that. It's, it's superstition. It's pretty silly, but uh, it's funny too. So what is this number? Again, different interpretations, different ideas. Some think that it represented uh, the Emperor Nero, because if you add up the numbers according to his name and you do this calculation, it turns out Nero equals 666. Um, others think that since the number of perfection is seven, then 777 would be what? It would be the Holy Trinity, right? It would be Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 777. So um, since Satan is the great copycat, he is, is 666 because he wants to be God. He wants to have this perfect number, but he just falls short, and he's the unholy trinity. You know, the simplest explanation that I think is that the Hebrews would often use numbers to symbolize letters. It's actually a whole, um, whole thing you can get into in research uh, that they have found, um, like, graffiti on the walls of places. They've In Pompeii, where it was volcanically covered suddenly, and the whole city was buried under volcanic ash. They've, they've unearthed some things, and it said something like, I love 482, or something like that. It was a number, because they would communicate like that sometimes. They would translate number or letters into numbers. And so if you kind of crunch the numbers a little bit, and you, you look at 666, uh, and you run it through a Hebrew filter, and you come out with Letters that translated mean or, or are the beast. <laughs> That's all it is. It's just simple. That 666 just is another way of saying the beast. So the mark of the beast is the beast. That's all, that's all, it, that's all it is. 
It's not some cursed number or it's not what actually like they're going to go around with the stamper and stamp 666 on everybody's forehead. Uh, you know, like if you've ever been to a theme park or something and they stamp your hand on the way out, you know, and you're a little paranoid, you know, you look at it. Is this the mark of the beast? You know, is it six? six what's on me? It's not like that. It's a little, a little more complicated than that. Because there's, a, there's another layer to the mark of the beast that's not really often considered. And it doesn't have much to do with an actual mark on the body at all. Look back with me at Deuteronomy 6 at what Moses told the Israelites before they went into the promised land. Now, keeping in mind, the mark of the beast is something that it says is on their forehead and on their hand, right? Okay, just pin that to the wall for a second as we read Deuteronomy 6. This is something that Jesus quoted. This was a really popular scripture for the New Testament Christians, for even Jesus. They would refer back to this, something they all knew, they memorized. And when Jesus was asked what the, what the greatest commandment was, uh, he referred to this. So let's read it. Deuteronomy 6, chapter, or verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Sound familiar yet? You, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Now look at verse 8. Remember what we read before? Remember what we talked about, the mark of the beast? He says about these teachings of God, the commands of God in verse 8. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. See, verse 8 is where the Jews get this idea of phylacteries. It may be a strange word for, for most of us, but phylacteries are something that the Jews even still use to this day. They are little tiny boxes that contain pieces of Scripture. And you would take a leather strap and you would tie it to your wrist and you would tie the box to your hand with this little piece of Scripture. You would also wrap it around your head and wear the box uh, right on your forehead. You could even Google it on your phone right now. Just type that word in. It's on your notes if you don't know how to spell it. And look at some of these guys that wear these phylacteries. The idea was that you are, you are digesting, you are meditating on the Word of God. And they wanted to take that as literal as possible. Just having it in a box on my forehead would affect my mind somehow. So it was a symbol of, of what what they wanted to be a deeper work. And so it's even done today by Jews to honor God and to worship him. So Jesus, we even see, he called out these Pharisees, these religious leaders, the ones that would wear these phylacteries. And, and he, in Matthew 23, when he said that you guys love to look really righteous on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead. What was he talking about? They looked to li they they like to to look righteous and holy. They would have these giant phylacteries on their head or on their wrist. But he called them hypocrites. See, they were a major symbol of identity. They represented who you belong to if you were one of God's people. So, in the end, Whichever trinity that you belong to in the tribulation should be so clear. Remember we talked about there is a holy trinity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There is an unholy trinity of Satan and the Antichrist and this false prophet. Fake versions, version of the Father, a fake version of the Son, and a fake version of the Holy Spirit. So in this tribulation, this mark of the beast, it will be an identity thing. It's going to be who do you belong to? It's going to be so clear, like it's, like it's really stamped on you, on your forehead or on your hand. So it's probably going to be a mark, but it's not just a mark. It's an identity thing. It's a worship thing. And worship doesn't just include wearing something or reciting a prayer. Worship is all that you are, your entire life. That's what we see in the end in heaven, that, that our entire lives are consumed with the Lord and worshiping him. It's what you pledge allegiance to. So this, this mark of the beast is going to be a part of the Antichrist identity somehow. 
But here's the thing. It's not like that you're going to get tricked to get it without even realizing what you're doing. Along with getting the mark comes this clear understanding that you approve of the Antichrist and his ways, that you have allegiance to him. In other words, you don't get the mark accidentally. You've got to choose. All the facts are going to be out there in the open. Those who receive the mark of the beast will do so knowing fully what they're doing. There's not going to be a place for neutrality or any, any middle ground. You're either going to pick God's side or the Antichrist side, and you're not going to have an option to opt out. So you'll either choose the Antichrist and eat well or reject him and possibly starve. Worship team, let me invite you back up for our closing song here in a minute. But let me also say about this, this mark of the beast that just to settle any fears uh, that people have about accidentally getting the mark of the beast and, and going to hell, some people just get consumed with that, like, oh, it's coming, the mark of the beast, and I can't get it, or I'll miss out, I'm going to go to hell. And Well, here's the thing. The mark of the beast does not override Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 says that we are saved by grace through faith. The deal doesn't change in the end, okay? In other words, my salvation isn't dependent upon some new technology that comes out. It doesn't say in the Bible that you're saved by grace through faith unless you accidentally get a microchip in your hand when you're just thinking you're, just thinking you're upgrading to the latest technology so that you can buy things. It's not a saved by grace through faith unless if you're in the end times and you get the mark of the beast accidentally and you don't know about it, you don't even know about the Antichrist, but you just get it, then you're doomed. That's not what this is about. The, the grace part, the salvation of Jesus on the cross, that sticks all the way to the end. If we're, if we're consumed with fear about, oh, am I going to get that on my hand and get the mark of the beast? Then we are cheapening the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that it's not powerful enough, that some kind of gimmick in the end is going to get me and overpower what Christ has done in my heart. That is not the case. You have to choose to turn away from God, to buy into the Antichrist lies. And then just the last two things that happen is that the th there'll be three angels that fly around the earth to preach the gospel, to declare the end of evil, and to announce the arrival of God's wrath. It's like the last call, God's last call for humanity to turn to him. These three angels go around the earth. And then we see the final battle, the battle of Armageddon. This takes place at the end of the tribulation. And that's where we'll pick up next week as we talk about Armageddon. And we really talk about, as we bring our series to a close next week, the happy ending for God's people in eternity. And that is where... That's where we've been wanting to end this whole time. All these dark things, all these confusing things lead to ultimate eternity with the light, Jesus Christ, that there will be no more sun because we don't need it because Jesus will be there. So we'll end it next week. But let's close with the song that we introduced last week, singing about our church, the church, that we are the bride of Christ and that we want to be ready. We want to be ready. We don't want to be lulled to sleep by our culture or by the enemy, but we want to be ready when he comes. We want to be sharpened. We want to be aware. We want to be discerning. So let's, let's sing this together. And, and as we do, following the song or even during the song, if you'd like, we, we wanted to be able to, to engage in prayer more with you. So there's a prayer tent over here by the gym behind that truck. And uh, Pastor Kenneth is going to be over there, and afterwards I'm going to join him. But if you'd like prayer, if you'd like to receive Christ as your Lord, as your Master, and as your Savior, this is a great day to do it. If you'd like prayer for healing or for a relational thing or whatever you need prayer for, we want to be there to just pray with you and pray together. So feel free to make your way over to that tent before you leave, and um, let's sing this song together.
Let's sing it together, all of creation. In all of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. And call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Sing it out. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing even so. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride. Like a bride waiting for her groom. We'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King. We sing even so. We wait your coming soon. So we wait. So we wait. We wait for you. God, we wait your coming soon. Like 
That's our prayer today. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you be a light in the darkness. Amen. Thanks for coming today and being a part. Educators, administration, we love you. Blessings on you this week. And we look forward to being inside in just two weeks from today. So we're excited. Give somebody a high five or an air five, I guess. And if you need prayer, you can come on over here to the tent.